Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to this, our fifth episode of SSH Writers on Writing, where we interview scholars, researchers, and writers across the discipline, the disciplines about their writing lives. And we ask them things like, do they have a specific process to their work? How is their writing different than that in writing in other disciplines? What do they expect from their students? And do they have a favorite swear word? My name is Lori Enns, and I'm the SSH Writing Center Coordinator at Nazarbayev University. And with me today is Assistant Professor of History, Mikhail Akulov. Professor Akulov, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Lori. Thank you. I'm, I'm flattered to be here. We're really happy to have you. Yeah. So for our listeners out there who don't know you, uh, Professor Akulov was born in Kazakhstan, but he spent much of his life outside of the country and within the United States. So my first question is, uh, does the American part of you exist harmoniously with your Kazakhstani side? I mean, they, they coexist all right. Uh, but I, what I want to um, probably say is that, is that uh, important as they are, um, I felt that national, national identities actually never really truly, fully, adequately captured, at least my experience. I, I actually, I feel uh, much more beholden to my memory or to my memories. I was a kind of in a Bakovian type of child um, whose memories, whose experience of childhood was essentially shaped by this I'm, so, I'm sounding sentimental, but of course, his experience of childhood was, was shaped by the limitless, illimitable amount of love offered by my parents, but mostly, of course, by my grandparents. Now, I mean, uh, truth be told, um, and not to go down this uh, slippery, slippery road of psychoanalysis, uh, when I did come to the United States as a half formed teenager, um, a substantial seg segment, a substantial chunk of my memory just got expurgated, hmm. purged entirely. Um, I remember a friend of mine who is a little older, he actually talked, uh, he told me about his own Estonian grandmother who was brought uh, right after the war, brought from Germany by, you know, by, by a person who would become he, you know, his grandfather, uh, from Germany where she was, uh, you know, part of this Zwangarbeiter the forced uh, laborer and so she was brought into this depth of Russia and she was 19 at that time and he said he claimed my friend that he forgot Estonian entirely even though she was 19 only I mean only already 19 not only so uh, I mean my experience is not as radical as that I mean I have not forgotten my my, my, my native tongue I have not forgotten Russian but I could actually somehow I could um, relate to this experience Okay, well that, that connects nicely to our next question. It comes from a student, a second year student in political science, Sukrat Turdiev. There is a popular opinion in Kazakhstan that everyone should know the history of their own past. Can you please comment on that and say, is there really a practical necessity to know it for everyone? Thank you. So, the popular opinion, which of course this, this question harks back to, and subjects to scrutiny contains so much which I um, find wrong with the view of history uh, promoted not actually by historians but by by myth makers namely that there is truth to history yeah, truth about the past uh, and that's mind you uh, that truth needs to be known not for its own sake but for the sake of some practical value that is to say well lo largely mostly to you know to fortify patriotic sentiments which of course translates into generally allegiance to uh, you know powers that be okay so if history is seen in that in that in the in, in those terms then no 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 history should not be known in fact just the other day i remember i read about um uh, you know things taking place in in, in russia right now there is this uh, series of proposals about to be enacted into law, they will become a law, which make it criminal under the pretext of uh, of, uh, what, of fighting against the rehabilitation of fascism, make it criminal to promote views of the Soviet past, which stand in contradistinction with those uh, uh, champions advocated by the state, right, and seen as uh, the only truthful ones. So I personally would say to somebody like this, it's better not 
it's better to deliberately avoid learning that kind of history than yet uh, than, than, than learn it uh, you know on this kind of platter golden platter extended by by the state so that being said why history then right so my history and I, I want to say that again it's extremely useful because history is this Nietzschean kind of hammer hammer with which uh, to 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 um, just to smash all the idols, including the idol of truth in the past, including the idol of truth. And, and I want to say, there is also a positive aspect to this, uh, but this positive aspect, the constructive aspect of history also stems from this realization that history is, is, is um, not owned by anyone, and that past is forever alive, is, is, is living as long as we, are, as we are alive. It might be very foreign, it's mostly very foreign. It's very eerie, but it's very eeriness of this past that should remind us of all the alter alternatives which were maybe once available to our collective becoming, but which are still available to you as a thinking, autonomous, you know, critical uh, individual. So then, if you're saying that, that uh, so if it's sort of the sanctioned history, the history that sort of sanctioned on a government level is not the one that students or people should um, necessarily go to for their truth. Uh, where, 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 what kinds of places then do we go to to find out more about history or sort of find oh, out more about stories of the past? We surely also tackle tackle the textbooks. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we should have some sort of materials to work with. I'm not saying that you should you should uh, deny this, but I'm only inviting uh, one for uh, you know to to be obviously to be to be more critical, to be asking questions, the kind of questions that we actually teach our students uh, in the history of Kazakhstan. You know, what's uh, what's the audience? You know, what are the motives uh, behind the motives there, etc. But you know. They say that anything could become an object of philosophy. True. I also say anything could become an object of history. There is no particular place where history is stored and located. Not even the archives. Yeah, archives are interesting. But the archives, of course, they speak history with a capital letter, you know, H, right? This is the kind of history they communicate. You know, I think uh, in the 20th century we have moved beyond uh, that, uh, this kind of magisterial view of history to comprehend that history is what is taking place between you and me right now. Yeah. So, yeah, then I guess you would, would you tell your students then just, just any kind of anything that you're reading about the past, you just, you like look at it with a critical eye, just assume that a human being has written it or a human being has made it and everything is made and written in a certain context. Sure. Is that what I'm hearing you saying? Sure, absolutely. But absolutely. Which, which doesn't mean it's false, but it certainly doesn't mean it's, it's, it's true. Right, you know, we we try yeah. not to. Think those, I mean, those binaries are probably you know good for computer science, you know, zero one. Uh, but history is not the study of past. History is study of human life. As you were moving towards your history being more and more part of your job and career, and you were writing in history, and you were seeing other people write in history, did that kind of writing and thinking come very naturally to you? No, not at all. Not at all. You know, again. Maybe I'm making, I mean, not, not maybe, I'm surely, surely making a gross, uh, you know, it's a gross generalization, overgeneralization. But it seems to me that uh, historians, uh, like writers, become better, <laughs> better with age, with experience. Uh, as I said, to, to be a good historian, uh, you should also regard your 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 own life as providing you with empirical material about yourself to be thought about, cogitated, brood over, uh, brooded over. Yeah, absolutely. You you teach a number of courses at the university, and I'm thinking about the papers that you uh, give to your students and what you expect from them. So, is there something? Let's start with the stuff that you that annoys you in student papers. So, when students hand you papers, is there a particular kind of error or mistake or just a, an approach to writing that you find annoying? Well, I mean, there are you know there are picadillos that annoy me, right? Uh, our, our students often think that you need to. Uh, insert the you know words like in this paper I will argue etc 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 and I think now quite a few of my colleagues uh, would 
certainly join me in this critical choir. But again, this is a minor thing. This is a minor thing. What's actually, what's actually, what actually annoys me, uh, annoys me, and and this is a kind of annoyance or frustration which uh, I don't actually channel towards the students. Actually, mostly towards myself, um, because I kind of feel that it's part of my job. So it's a lack of courage. It's hmm. a lack of courage and 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 uh, dogmatism. A lack of courage and dogmatism. This uh, history courses, and I'm sure this goes for many other humanities, they offer you this exceptional opportunity to, you know, to answer the stage as a full-fledged individual, right? It's kind of to explore yourself, to to claim the you know the lead lead part in your own in your own life, and then of course you know, and then in the end of the day, you know, you try to. Uh, regurgitate what you think your professor wants you wants uh, you to say, or what's you know what's what you've heard from others, and it is actually you know that is held as sacrosanct. So yes, this lack of courage troubles me. But as I say, I, as I said, I do not blame students for this. This is my task. Uh, if they if they stay, if they fail to learn to be courageous, then I say to myself, I must have done something wrong again. Okay, so I think I'm, from what I'm hearing, are, are you saying that students should be more bold with going about and making claims about history for their paper as opposed to trying to figure out what you want them to say? Absolutely. So making a claim. Absolutely. I, I, okay. I would rather... I would rather see a student disagree with me and defend uh, uh, and defend, you know, his or her point of view. Uh, they simply try to repeat uh, what I'm saying. And again, maybe I'm being inconsistent. Again, as I said, being a historian requires a degree of introspection, right? It requires also, you know, questioning yourself. Yeah, something that you said before also struck me. You were saying that uh, when students say, in this paper, I will argue. So I, I know that my students have had this discussion because they sometimes uh, they feel that, so in some disciplines, that's what's required of them, right? So I think that in the more social science disciplines, um, it feels to me like that there is a bit of a, a change in between the humanities and social sciences. And one of them is that in the social sciences, you're, you're more expected to uh, um, announce what it is that you're going to be arguing. So in this sure. paper, I will argue these three things. Um, is it is that your sense too that in, in the humanities maybe in the history and maybe in philosophy I'm not sure about philosophy um, are are you are you not expected then to announce exactly what it is that you're arguing? You you are not you are not uh, you are not. I, I think again um, you know what is this that, that distinguishes humanities or social sciences? Again, I can't provide you with an answer because I think it's again it's a sixty-four you know dollar question or a million dollar question. That there have been inflation lately, uh, but one thing I think that still is there is that you know we historians for the year yeah, for historical reasons right still lay some emphasis on on the aesthetics, and uh, you know honestly claims like that are not very graceful. Uh, this simply, it's not only that obviously it's it's what you are arguing right. <laughs> You know, it's it's what you are arguing, right? That this is already implicit, but it's also, uh, it's also not again. It's not aesthetically aesthetically pleasing. Um, regarding your work, uh, does it does it take a lot for you? Let's say that you're you're working on a project, you're working on a paper or anything like that. Um, do do you have to make yourself get to work, or is it something that you easily just fall into? You know, you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, and you sit down, and you start writing, or do you have to make yourself? Get to your uh, paper. I, I wish I was. I was like that. I wish I was <laughs> like that. I wish I could wake up. Well, I, I do wake up early in the morning, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, actually, I found out that, that with age, this becomes easier to wake up earlier. Is that what you think? Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. Right. Uh, but and I do kind of have a list of priorities. And yet, I always fall for the second and third priority. <laughs> this, is, this is obviously not 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 the good thing. I should be. I should start precisely as you say, by sitting down and writing. Instead, I, I do. You know, I, I prepare myself for for lectures. Not that, that lectures. Well, 
they're important, but presumably research is even more important, right? Uh, and then I grade student papers, etc. And then uh, by the time it's done, I'm so exhausted that I can't actually move myself to, to research. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I have to, uh, the answer to the question is yes, I do have to force myself. I do have to force myself. And I find all kinds of often excuses uh, not to do this, that's to say. I, need, I say to myself, I need to learn more, I need to read more, I need to get into, you know, more archives, get more information. And this could go on forever until yeah. you say, oh, stop. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you accumulate enough information, now you have no excuses. <laughs> now you have no excuses, just start writing. But when I do start writing, I mean, again, it takes some time uh, for me to kind of get into the mood, to warm myself up. Uh, there's something, you know, it's, it's an, almost an athletic exercise. You have to, you know, get your blood going. Then, uh, then at one point, I find myself drawn to the point where I can't even extricate myself. You know, drawn. Yeah. I could forget about having, you know, I could forget about, you know, lunches and and dinners and, and suppers. But again, it, it takes it, it. It it you know, it, it does not come immediately. This this uh, yeah. this uh, sort of uh, feeling of being uh, seized uh, uh, by the work. But it it does happen to me. Okay, so speaking of unnatural experiences, we're going to go to the questions on that are derived from the Proust questionnaire. So, uh, are are we ready for this? Okay, so, all right, are we ready? So here we go. Uh, the first question is, what is your favorite word? Do you have a favorite word? My favorite word is indubitable. Because it's, oh, okay. It's so, 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 sounds so funny, indubitable. <laughs> and is, is it because of the way it sounds or its meaning or is it all of those things? Because of the way it sounds. Okay, so um, you are a history professor. I know. Is there any other profession that you would have been had you not become? Is there anything else that you would, would be really interested in besides being a history professor? Well, you know, I, I told you at the beginning that I've, I've never, I never made a conscious choice to become a historian, right? So I'm, I'm actually, again, it's an extension of who I am. I'm very happy. But if I'm, again, for the sake of the game, I think I could say that, well, why not? I would like to become a marine biologist. Okay, a marine biologist. There's no, no, no opportunity that, that actually it, it provides me to go, you know, to go into the depth. Historians also enter into the depths, right, of the time. And marine biologists go into the depth of the space. So conversely then, what job do you think you would really hate to be end so <laughs> to end up doing what? I understand, all right. But as a good Soviet child, you know, I learned to respect all professions, you know, all trades, all things, yeah. except for that of a stockbroker. I'm just a stockbroker. Okay, so that would be your most that that would be the thing you would stay away from. No stockbroking. Probably because I have absolutely zero skill in that. <laughs> and I would go, you know, I would go from one existential crisis to another, just asking myself. <laughs> Okay, and then do you have a do you have a favorite author? You might have more than one, but maybe you could just tell us one or two. Yeah, it was a difficult books. question actually. I, I like Bruno Schulz a lot. It's a Polish writer from the 1920s, and anyone with his kind of sensitivities, like Vitol Gombrowicz, Franz Kafka, yeah, Andrei Platonov, yeah. Mm, okay. Those kind of writers who. You know, tackle the thingness of life to the point where we kind of already start seeing the you know the border between sense and the nonsense. You know? uh, like the absurd, there when they actually yeah, focus. right on the cusp, right on the border. Uh, right, okay. Right. <laughs> right. So we're not quite there. So we're still sort of in this physical world that we agree on, but we're sort of looking over absolutely. the cusp. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay, and final question. What would you like to be inscribed on your tombstone? I think I would like to be cremated. <laughs> <laughs> Good save. <laughs> Good save. Okay, so I won't pry any further then. So I'm conscious that you have another meeting very soon, and I think then we'll wrap this up to give you time to get ready for that. So I just want to end by saying thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you for your interesting answers and uh, uh, being with us to talk with us today. Thank you very much, Professor Mikhail Akulov. Well, thank you, Lori. Thank you very much. Thank you.